and to underemphasize because it is a little sad, is, is that it's, it's amazing how, 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 how quickly it becomes difficult to actually change human behavior. Um, so even by the age of 10, it seems to be really difficult to actually change how kids react to even a simple marshmallow task. Um, and that's, 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 that's why they're really focused on younger interventions, four, five, six, seven-year-olds. Has, hi. Oh. I'm sorry, what about metacognition? What is available out there in metacognitive thinking? Mm-hmm. Yeah. People like ourselves might be able to do. Do you mean if resisting marshmallows isn't a usual part of your day? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Um, well, well, you know, it, it comes back to what I said at the very end, which is that, um, you know, there, there's lots of research to suggest that, that different kinds of decisions benefit from different kinds of thinking. Um, you know, and so, you know, as I said, I think the first thing it helps you do is avoid those mistakes. Thinking about thinking helps you avoid biases and mistakes that have already been outlined by science. The other thing it, I think it really allows you, and this, this I think is the most important thing it allows you to do, is to adjust your thought process to the task at hand so that scientists, there's some preliminary evidence that certain kinds of decisions, for instance, very tough decisions, decisions that involve lots and lots of variables, um, lots of information, that they benefit the most from a more emotional, unconscious thought process. This is work done by Abdi Jahao at the University of Netherlands, um, who he's done experiments with cars, asking people to pick the best car. Um, so he gives people four different car options, and in the first, this is the easy condition, each of the four cars is written in four different categories for 16 total pieces of information. And so in this case, he asked people to look at all these cars, and they're rated in stuff like, you know, trunk space, horsepower, fuel economy, all the usual variables. And one car is objectively ideal. And he asked people in this easy scenario to make a decision either unconsciously, just make it quick, or, you know, look at it for a couple seconds, then make a decision, or to, you know, give them a couple minutes to analyze the data. And not surprisingly, in this scenario, making a conscious decision works at best. So when you consciously analyze these four different cars and these 16 pieces of information, you find the best car the vast majority of the time, like 55% of the time. So far, so obvious, Plato, you know, Plato wouldn't be surprised at all. Reason is best. But then there's the hard condition, where he's got those same four cars, but now each car is rated in 12 different categories, 12 different variables for 48 total piece of information, which is a lot of information, and, and probably much more closely approximates the reality of car buying, in which there's so much, so much stuff to consider. You know, it's not just trunk space and horsepower, it's cost, reliability, all, all you know, back seat room, all the various parameters. And here what he finds is that when you ask people to consciously analyze the hard scenario, to use their reason, to use deliberate reason in the prefrontal cortex to make this decision, they find the best car less than 25% of the time. So they perform worse than random chance. However, the other condition is he gives people the data, lets them look at it for a couple minutes, then gives them the word puzzle to distract their conscious brain for a little while, for five, 10 minutes while they're, you know. So, so they're not thinking about cars now. They're just consciously thinking about this word puzzle. Uh, and then 10 minutes later, he says, quick, make a decision about a car. And now what he finds is that they find the best car more than 60% of the time. So, so what this suggests, and, and it's important to say this is still just preliminary evidence, but what this suggests is that what they're doing while they're doing the word puzzles, their unconscious is still mulling over these car options. And so, and so other experiments like this have, have led some psychologists to suggest that decisions that involve lots and lots of information, it's simply too much information for our rational brain, so to speak, for our prefrontal cortex to handle, because this can only handle, you know, seven bits of information in a given moment. You give them more than that, and it starts to short circuit. It's like, you know, ask an old computer to run Windows Vista. It just kind of bugs out. Um, so, so, so in conditions like that, it's actually important to trust your unconscious and trust these emotions it generates uh, to actually guide your decisions. So, so that's one way metacognition can allow you to toggle back and forth between these different modes of thinking. So you can say, well, what kind of decision am I making here? Is it a hard decision? Is it an easy decision? How much information does it involve? And then adjust your thought process accordingly. There are some types of things that um, people fear, but that might still be good for them. So, for example, flying on an airplane or, uh, you know, going to the office party or something like that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> my, my question is, if you're, the, if you're the person in charge of the airline or in charge of the office party, are there any sort of things that you've learned that would let that person appeal to those people who sort of have a fear, but yet at the same time you know, there's something good in there for them. Yeah. You know, it's a, 
Great question. As someone who still gets a little nervous every time they fly, and, and, I, and, and a big part of how we decide is about the safety of flight and trying to figure out why it's so safe and why pilot error has so dramatically decreased in the last few decades. So I, I very, I'm very well acquainted with, this, with the statistics of airplane safety and how the most dangerous part of flying is to drive to the airport, yada, yada, yada. And yet I still get nervous every time they taxi to the runway. Um, and, and, you know, I think what that really illustrates and what the question, you know, it's such a great question, what it really gets at is this disconnect between, on the one hand, the facts, and on the other hand, these, you know, limbic, primal responses we have to certain scenarios. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really unfortunately not aware of, of any good research. I mean, there's, there's been some research on people who have OCD or these really terrible phobias, and, and exposure therapy seems to be one of the more effective ways actually forcing them to kind of deal with these, these horrible things they imagine, be it you know, getting on a plane or going to an office party, because uh, chances are they won't turn out that badly. Um, that seems to be a little bit effective, but in terms of rational education, in terms of just exposing people to the facts, um, I think you know, there really is this disconnect, and, and it really is a problem, be it you know, dealing with our fear, and, and there are all sorts of irrational fears, um, which, which I think have a big role in public policy and political decisions, be it you know, perhaps an outsized fear of terrorism, which, you know, which, which, which may not be quite so terrifying after all if you just look at the numbers, or, or getting on a plane. Um, nevertheless, there is this disconnect, and, and there, are all, there are all sorts of biases, many of them that you can trace back to Kahneman and Fersky, um, which, which help explain why these fears exist, be it the availability heuristic, which is that certain memories are just much easier to summon to the surface. So it's much easier to remember a memory about a plane crash, um, even though the vast majority of planes, the 99.99999% of planes land safely, except it's, we don't remember those. We remember, oh, the you know, front page headline of the plane that crashes. So there are all sorts of biases that play in to these irrational fears. Unfortunately, uh, I've got to give you the answer, at least to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any you know, magic bullet which, which can make these phobias disappear. I think uh, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that, that giving people the facts um, isn't that helpful. Um, you know, perhaps one thing we have to do is, is to learn to reframe the facts in a more visceral, emotional manner. Simply giving people dry percentages ain't going to cut it. What you have to do is, is somehow make those statistics, you know, drill them, and down, drill them down to the same emotional areas that are in charge of the fear in the first place. Um, uh, hi. Um, I've been trying to ask my question for a while. Uh, sorry. So. <laughs> Um, has there been any studies about uh, children who are learning different, like with dyslexia or if they have ADD or ADHD, and, and what does constant repetition do, or is there certain ways of, re I mean, in their decision making, I mean, what works, what doesn't, because yeah. they work a little bit differently? Uh, I mean, I, there, there have been some very interesting studies of these um, developmental disorders in children. Um, you know, there's, there's a great paper that came out, um, it was by the NIMH uh, and McGill in 2008, it was, it was one of the big brain scanning studies of ADHD and ADD children, looked at hundreds of kids, and, uh, and what they found is that ADD seems to be caused by a developmental lag that these children seem to be about anywhere between two and five years behind schedule, that the brain develops at a, different brain areas develop at a different pace, and the last brain area to develop is the prefrontal cortex, the quote unquote rational brain, which is in charge of things like directing attention, controlling attention, keeping you on task, self-control, stuff like that, that, that there just seems to be, to be this developmental lag. The brain develops at a slower pace. Um, the, the good news is that in the vast majority of cases, this developmental lag disappears by the time you reach your late teens, that, that you catch up and, and, and the symptoms seem to disappear. Um, so so that's, that's the good news. I think this also, by the way, helps explain adolescence. You know, uh, the behavior of a 15-year-old is that they've got a fully developed limbic system. Their emotional brain is rearing to go. They've got all these hormones coursing through their mind. But their rational brain, so to speak, is just not quite developed yet. It's, it's still a soft, you know, not quite dense bit of tissue. So, 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 so they lack the mental muscles to resist all these strong impulses to telling them to drive too fast and have unprotected sex. Um, so so, so there's, there's some, I think, compelling evidence that a similar thing is going on in kids with attention deficit disorder, that, that it really is a byproduct of a brain that's developing a bit slower. And I think it also helps to highlight just how many skills we ask the prefrontal cortex to do. So this is the brain area that develops last 
in adolescence. Uh, it's probably not fully solidified until your late teens. Um, and, and, and we ask it to you know, exert willpower, self-control, delay gratification, working memory, um, and, and I think most critically in the classroom, um, stay on task, pay attention. Um, and, and so that's asking them to do a lot. Uh, and when it develops a little slower, you start to see a lag in all these skills um, you know, at the same time. Um, so, so, so that, I think, is a leading hypothesis for what's going on um, in, in, in the brain in terms of ADD and ADHD. We're going to take one last question right up front, and then Jonah's going to be doing a book sign. I'm actually having trouble deciding which of two questions to ask. <laughs> so I'll ask them both and let you pick which oh. one to answer. That's, that's, that, that, that's one of my favorite strategies, too, is, by the way, just outsource the decision, <laughs> uh, which I probably shouldn't admit considering I wrote the book about it. But um, <laughs> So my first question is, are you any better at picking cereal? And my mm. second question is, the research that you have done, does it lead you to believe that our school systems should spend more time teaching children how to think than to memorize and to pass standardized mm. tests? Um, I think I can handle both those questions. Um, in terms of cereals, um, my secret, uh, which I have not patented yet, um, so please don't steal it, is you buy Honey Nut Cheerios and multigrain and mix them in the bowl. Um, <laughs> It's the, the exact level of sweetness I've been looking for. Um, in, 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 in terms of schools, I mean, I think if you talk to people like Walter or the, or the founders of the KIPP schools, they argue that, that, you know, in kindergarten you get a report card, and on the left side is all, the, all these quote-unquote character skills. Um, things like pay attention, socialize as well, doesn't talk out of turn, and then all of a sudden you hit first grade and that whole part of the report card disappears. And they say, you know, that's a terrible thing. Um, so, so, so one of the KIPP schools in Philadelphia has actually printed a t-shirt they give to every incoming sixth grader. It says, don't eat the marshmallow. Um, and, and, and what they're trying to get across is this idea of character skills are still important. That long after you forgot in your algebra, maybe, maybe some of these metacognitive skills, some of these thoughts about thinking, some of these strategies to help you do your homework, to help you delay gratification, to help you accomplish your goals, that, that they might remain with you. Uh, and, the other important thing to note is that they also have this you know, avalanching effect. So, so you teach a kid how to think at second grade, that'll make it easier for him to do his homework in fourth grade, in fifth grade, and as a senior in high school, and in college, um, that, that, that they seem to have this compounding effect. So I think it really does make the argument that character skills aren't something you should stop teaching in kindergarten. It's something you should really just begin teaching then. Um, because I think the, 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 the real lesson I think too many people aren't aware of is that you can actually change these character skills. That, that you know, I think too many people have come away from various studies with this vaguely deterministic notion that if you fail the test at the age of four or, or you don't come from the right parents, that you're just destined to not succeed. Uh, but, but that's not at all the case, I think. I think because metacognition is so malleable, I think there's plenty of evidence that, that you can get good results, that you can improve these skills which govern how we do in school, which govern how we behave in the real world. Um, so, so, so I'm personally optimistic, um, even though the data isn't quite there yet. Um, but, but thank you all so much for coming and for listening. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>